Hi, I'm Ross Turk from Ink Tank, uh, now a Red Hat subsidiary, and I'm going to give a talk today on an introduction to Ceph. This is a talk I've given a bunch of times in the past. Um, it's an overview of all the different architectural components that make up the Ceph storage system, how they fit together, and what they do. But first, I'd like to start by talking about a little bit uh, about what Ceph is and, and why it exists in the ecosystem. If you look on the left-hand side of the slide here at your traditional proprietary storage stack, it's a whole bunch of proprietary hardware, a bunch of computers and a bunch of disks that you can't really do much with. They're put together in, a, in an appliance. On top of that is some proprietary software, and on top of that is a support and maintenance contract. And this is big business. This is billions and billions of dollars of business. The Ceph approach is something different. It's standard hardware, normal computers with normal disks, uh, everyday hardware, open source software that you don't pay for, and then enterprise products and services that you can, that you can use if you need them, uh, if, if you really need them. So it's, it's a completely different approach. And in general, what Ceph aims to do is do to storage what Linux did to the operating system so that um, people can use open source software and standard hardware to do what used to be a, a very proprietary activity. <coughs> Taking a broad look at Ceph, this is an architectural overview. It starts with Rados at the bottom. LibRados is a programming library. And then on top of that, there are three interfaces, Rados Gateway, the Rados Block Device, and CephFS. I'm going to walk into each one of these and talk about what makes them interesting. <clears throat> and I'll start with Rados, the one at the bottom. Oh, I'll go back. Rados is actually an acronym. It stands for Reliable Autonomic Distributed Object Store. And Rados is the object store that's underneath everything in the Ceph architecture. The Rados cluster is made up of monitors and OSDs. And an OSD looks sort of like this shape on the left, where you have a server with disks, standard disks. And you put standard file systems on top of those disks. EXT4, ButterFS, or XFS are the chosen file systems now. We think ButterFS is the future. Uh, EXT4 is the one we're choosing right now. Uh, on top of that file system, you run object storage daemons. These are software agents uh, that, that you just configure with a path. And what they do is they take the storage resources that are available at that path, and they make them part of the object storage cluster, part of the Rados cluster. Uh, and then they become one of many, many servers in the Rados cluster. The important thing to know here is that underneath an object storage daemon in Rados is a file system. And then, of course, as an application, you don't deal with just one of these OSDs. You deal with the cluster as a logical whole, as a collection of OSDs and monitors, and you address it as, as a single entity. The components of Rados, just to sort of review them, are the OSDs and the monitors. The OSDs tend to be tens to thousands, tens to ten thousands in a cluster for OSDs. These are the things that actually serve stored objects to the clients. So when you get data out of a Rados cluster, uh, you're getting it through the OSDs. The client connects directly to the OSDs. There's generally one OSD per disk. Uh, you can also put uh, SSDs under them, of course. You can put RAID groups under them if you want, although you, you may end up having some redundancy because Ceph does its own replication. But generally, you configure the OSD with a path to store its information in. And it, ser it serves all these storage objects to clients, and also these OSDs intelligently peer with one another for replication tasks and for recovery tasks. I like to tell people that the architecture of Ceph is closer to BitTorrent than it is to NetApp, and I think you'll understand why in a little bit. It's, it's more like a peer-to-peer -peer network than it is a monolithic storage appliance. The monitors, on the other hand, are a fewer number. You don't need lots of these. You need a small, odd number of these. Uh, more than one, generally, if you want to have uh, uh, the ability to uh, you know, cope with the failure of it. Uh, three is the right number for most clusters. Some clusters have five, but three is generally the right number. You want a small, odd number because monitors vote, uh, and their job is to understand the state of the cluster. Who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down, which OSDs are part of the cluster and which are not, and they also maintain what's called the crush map, which is the mapping of the architecture of the cluster, which is used to determine where to put data into the cluster. The monitor does not serve objects to clients. It's not part of the data path. So that's why you can have a small, odd number of these, is because the data that you get from Ceph is not actually going through these monitors. It's important to have a small number because they vote, like I said. Uh, and the more monitors you have, the longer it takes for them to vote. And you want an odd number because if there's ever a tie, uh, it uses Paxos underneath to figure out how to resolve a tie if there is. But a small, odd number is the most effective way. So this is Rados. It's essentially a collection of software daemons, uh, OSDs and monitors, that manage the underlying storage resources and then make them available. A thing that's kind of interesting about Rados is where objects live. Um, when you have a distributed storage cluster and you need to put an object into it, uh, the question is, which, which host do I connect to? It is a TCP connection after all. Which host do I connect to to store this object into the cluster? And one way of doing that is, you know, step one is you go to a metadata server and you say, I'm looking for this object. Where is it? And it goes, oh, it's on server 25. And then you go to that server. 
Uh, the challenge with this approach is that you're writing down where everything is. And if you're writing down where everything is, uh, you have a scalability limitation because the place where you're writing it down can only be so big and you can only read it so big and you can only query it so quickly. Uh, the other approach is to calculate the placement of the object inside the cluster. And a lot of folks, uh, or a lot of technologies, will do this by taking the cluster and splitting it up into, you know, uh, li li like a bookshelf with the World Book Encyclopedia on it, where you have A through Z, and M is really big, and then they put Q and Z together, and, uh, you know, a lot of it will work that way. And then, as the client, if my file name starts with F, I know it's on the third book down or whatever. So you choose the right server based on the name and a, a general distribution across the cluster. Uh, which, which works in general, except when the cluster grows and shrinks and there's massive repositioning that has to, that has to occur. So that's the second approach. Ceph does something different. Ceph uses an algorithm called crush, which is also calculated on the client, but it's calculated based on a policy. So what happens is you take the object, it'll split the object up into a number of groups, then it'll use crush to determine where those objects live inside the cluster. Crush is a function, it's a C function, and you pass it two things. The first is the cluster map, which is a data structure of which nodes are in and out and up and down. And the second thing you pass it is your crush map, which is the hierarchy in your cluster and a series of policies. Like, I have this many rows and this many racks and this many shelves. Never put two copies of the same object in the same failure domain. So what ends up happening is the cluster is constantly using crush, this algorithm, to rebalance the data in the cluster and clients who want to interact with the cluster are using this function to figure out where to connect in the cluster. And as long as the cluster map and the crush map are the same, it will have the same result. And then you use, you use it's a very quick calculation. It takes almost no time at all. When you want to store an object in the cluster, you call a calculation, you give it those two things, and it says, here are the servers that it belongs on. And if the cluster changes, the results change too. So to review, crush is what we call a pseudo-random placement algorithm. It's not random. Uh, but it's pseudo-random. It's a fast calculation, there's no lookup. It's repeatable and deterministic, uh, meaning that uh, if you call it again with the same inputs, it will always give you the same outputs, and only the inputs affect the outputs. That's what we mean by repeatable and deterministic. It gives you a statistically uniform distribution. If you call crush on a wide variety of data, it's going to distribute it relatively uh, in a uniform fashion. And it's a stable mapping, meaning that when your cluster changes, very little of the mapping actually changes. If you have 100 nodes in your cluster and you lose one, you're moving data from 99 nodes to 99 nodes, essentially, and it's only 1% of the data that has to move. So everything doesn't take a big step back, you know, or, or move one step to the left, like, ha like happens in some systems. It's also rule-based, so you set policies based on the infrastructure, or on the topology of your infrastructure, and based on weighting and adjustable replication policies. So the idea is you configure crush, crush handles the, the placement of the data in the cluster. So that's Rados. It's a, it, I, I barely scratched the surface of what Rados is. Uh, how you access Rados is LibRados. So LibRados is essentially how you access, an how you access Rados if you are an application. Uh, it's, it's a library. It's C, uh, C++, uh, Python, Ruby. There's a bunch of native language uh, bindings. You link it into your application, and it speaks a very efficient protocol to talk to the cluster. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a raw socket protocol. It's not over HTTP or anything like that. That's, that's Librados. Uh, it's C++, Python, PHP, Java, Erlang, uh, direct access to the storage nodes, very little overhead. If you're writing an application and you're tying it t tightly to, uh, to Ceph, this is the way to do it. And it's also the library that we've used to program, or to, to create all of the other storage interfaces. And one of them all I'll start with is the Rados Gateway. This is built on top of Librados. Rados Gateway is essentially uh, a REST interface on top of Rados. So if you want to store objects into the Rados cluster uh, using REST, uh, using the S3 or Swift uh, interfaces, you run Rados Gateway. You can run multiple of them and put them behind load balancers or do whatever you need to do. Uh, they speak REST out of the top, and out of the bottom they speak that efficient wireline socket protocol I was talking about. This is what, for example, DreamHost used to build Dream Objects, which is their, um, their S3 competitive product. So Rados Gateway is a REST-based object storage proxy. Everything that it stores, all of its buckets, all of its accounting, all of its managing who has access to what, is also stored in Rados. So these Rados Gateways are ephemeral. You can kill one and start up another, and all the same stuff is there. It's compatible with applications uh, that are written for S3 and Swift, and it's integrated into Keystone. So it's a, it's a drop-in replacement for Swift and OpenStack. The second thing that got built on top, of, on top of Ceph is our block interface, which we call the Rados block device. 
This is uh, kind of an interesting thing in that it takes a disk image, splits it up into a bunch of chunks, generally four megabyte chunks, and stores each chunk as an object inside of Rados, then has libRBD, which is a user space library, or krbd, which is a kernel module, that assembles all those chunks into a disk and presents it to a hypervisor or into a host. Uh, so this is, uh, this is something that is used uh, for Cinder, for example, uh, to access virtual machines and boot them straight off of the cluster. And it allows things like live migration, where you can have a hypervisor move a virtual machine from, from one to the other because you're separating storage from compute. It also has a kernel module. So to summarize, RBD is storage of disk images in Rados. It decouples the VM from the host. It has cool things like snapshots, copy on write clones. It's got support in the mainline Linux kernel since 2.639. It's uh, integrated into Q, QMU and KVM. Uh, you can make it work with Zen. Native Zen support's coming soon. And it's integrated into most of the cloud stacks, including, of course, OpenStack. This is how you store disks inside of Rados. The third thing is CephFS. CephFS introduces a new type of storage node called the metadata server, uh, which handles hierarchy uh, and all the POSIX semantics that you, that you need for, for, for having a, a distributed file system. Uh, and there's actually two things. So the first thing when you want to store things in CephFS is you talk to the metadata server, then you do the data path through the OSDs. This metadata server is not required unless you're running the file system aspect of Ceph. Uh, it also stores all of its metadata in Rados, and it's not part of the data path. So in the, if you're not running the file system, you don't really need to worry about it, but it's another cluster component that you need if you are running CephFS. This is sort of an overview of how Ceph and OpenStack integrate. Uh, the Rados gateway is the integration point for Keystone and Swift, allowing object storage inside Rados uh, in, in a way that, it, that integrates with OpenStack. Uh, on the block side, Cinder and, uh, uh, Cinder and Glance and Novar are integrated with the Rados block device to allow storage of uh, volumes, snapshots, and, uh, and disk images inside of, inside of Ceph and boot off of them in a way that will read from a whole bunch of storage nodes at once when you're booting a virtual machine. So getting started with Ceph, um, you can always go to ceph.com slash get to download Ceph. You can learn about Ceph uh, at ceph.com slash docs. You can read the quick start guide to get up and running quickly at ceph.com slash qsg. And if you need help, you can go to ceph.com slash help. There are volunteers waiting with shifts on IRC to answer your questions because we want to make sure everybody can understand how, how Ceph works and get it, get it up and running. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. Uh, I'm Ross Turk, VP of Marketing Community at Ink Tank, now a Red Hat subsidiary. I can be reached at uh, ross at inktank.com or my Twitter handle, uh, at Ross Turk. Thank you very much. <laughs>